Lo McNeil. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for your very kind words of introduction. Yes, 40 years has been a long time practicing architecture. I'm still practicing, and hopefully, before long, I might become good at it. Um, sorry for that, Owen. I should also thank Kath for the catering. She's done a great job, and before I forget that, I should get it in right now. Um, it's, so, really, um, it's been quite a while I've been at this game, and these red dots there represent all the properties. Sorry, gone, gone the wrong way, sorry. These dots represent all the properties I've been working on for many, many years. Every one of these dots represents a huge, passionate journey of care, thought, and attention of detail with our clients. Not just me, but all my staff here who have been with me for a long, long time. Michael for 34 years, Paul 28, Sula 22, I think, Linda 18. It's just astonishing, and I'm hugely grateful for you all sticking with me for so long in setting out to achieve all we've done for our clients in these properties. And I should thank every one of you here tonight who have been part of that process. Um, moving forward, I'd like to talk about really post-war modernity and what was happening in 1960. We were coming out of a period of great austerity and then were great plans to be like every other city in Britain and clear away all the slums and create wonderful new inner city ring roads. And this is the plan from the Buchanan report. And here he is in Princess Street. Princess Street had all the right along there being replaced these modern buildings with first floor walkways to replace the great Georgian and Victorian architecture of the past. The roads came round under Waverley, and if that was bad, then you look at Stock Bridge. Here's um, Stock Bridge. You have Rayburn Place, the colonies, um, North Park Terrace, split in two, um, down here, Comedy Bank, and these are artistic plans of how it would all look. Um, thank goodness that never happened. Um, then you go on to George Street. They're going to knock down West Register House, clear away Charlotte Square Gardens and create a road from George Street right through to Belleville Street. My next door neighbour was Anne Dewar, who, who was known as Ring Road Annie, who, with her fellow protagonists, chained themselves to the railings and prevented that atrocity from ever happening. Um, Edinburgh was also going through a stage of clearing slums. He wanted to create these utopian orbital villages of Wester Hills, Craig Miller, um, um, all the rest of them. And these, uh, these were fantastic at the time. It was all part of this modernity. People wanted to have hot and cold water, free of rats infestation. They wanted to have rooms for their children to live in. They wanted houses they could afford to heat, to light, and to maintain. So it was really a very unfortunate exercise in social engineering when, in essence, Edinburgh eradicated the working man from the city centre. Um, in 1959, there was a disaster waiting to happen, and the penny tenement collapse occurred. It was a rude awakening for the city fathers, and the aftermath was 800 tenements were demolished in St Leonard's and Dumby Dykes over the next couple of years partially to clear the way for the eastern approach road, which created a blight in that part of Edinburgh for, gosh, 30 years. Um, the penny tenement was literally what it was when a tenement, the cost of maintaining and repairing that tenement, exceeded the market value. Um, we had Jamaica Street 1970 next to Kays Bar, which we, sorry, Kays Bar, which we should all know well, and that was replaced it. The, math, the aftermath of Jamaica Street was the modern... Um, sheltered housing. 1966 saw a great change. The making of classical Edinburgh was a book by um, Professor Youngston. It was a great insight into the new town and what it had and what it should and what should be retained and how it should let people be awakened into the idea of keeping the new town and not having it cleared. They had plans, gosh, in Edinburgh there was St James's Place went away um, to create new houses. There was um, the whole of the south side Grange, not sorry, not south side, uh, Marchmont and Brunsfield was to be cleared completely as slums with high rise buildings put up there. So it was massive changes afoot for Edinburgh. So that started things happening. And then in 1967, there was an exhibition for the bicentenary of a new town called 200 Summers in the City, organised by an architect, John L. Patterson. This was again created this momentum of the interest of what the new town was about and how it should hopefully be saved. 
1970, a conference occurred, the conservation of George Edinburgh in the Assembly Rooms, and that was perhaps the greatest achievement in conservation in post-war Britain. It was the campaign that saved the new town of Edinburgh. In 71, the Housing Corporation funded the New Town Conservation Committee with the chap in the flat cap, Desmond Hodges. Desmond Hodges was a remarkable man. Um, when I set up practice, he was for many years my mentor. I hugely admired all he did, and he was a great help to me. So the New Town Conservation Committee started off by repairing buildings around the periphery of the New Town. The first one was in Fetty's Row, which was saved from a dreadful state of repair to the improvements, and it was opened by the Queen Mother, I think, in about 75. Um, going back, the Newtown Conservation Committee also prepared the Cairn Conservation of George and Edinburgh, a handbook, which was a wonderful bible for any architect who wished to become involved in conservation. Um, moving forward, in 1977, the statutory listing policies were introduced to protect the buildings against change. Um, there were many great things about that, but there's also the downside. It prevented evolution in the new town. When the new town was first built, it was lots of really very bland tenements, Georgian tenements that were all the same or unified. But we saw down Dublin Street and many other streets at Edinburgh, shops, two-storey shops, Dundas Street, and all that added character to the new town. But in 1977, that was stopped dead in its tracks. Um, you take, for instance, the Lorimer modifications in the 30s. This is the building in Melville Street. There was another in Abercrombie Place. I was involved in Abercrombie Place one. In fact, it's Kirsty Duff's aunt and uncle who sold it to one of my clients. And in the basement there, there are some wonderful original Georgian fireplaces, doors, surrounds, windows. The whole lot was there. And my client asked, could they put that back and get rid of what, what had been done by Lorimer in the 30s? The answer was a resounding no. They said that that was all part of the evolution of the new town and should all be kept as a memory of what Lorimer had achieved. So in 1977, any well-recognised architect who might have ideas to do things himself in the new town and stamp his authority, that was stopped dead in its tracks by the listings, by the policies that prevented change. Um, 1980 came along, so I get some water. Nineteen eighty came along and we had a massive recession. Since 1980, I've been involved in four recessions, in 1988, 1999, 2008, and maybe there's one coming around the corner now. But during that time, I don't think I've ever seen a drop in property prices in the new town. They've all gone up in price or stayed where they were. They've avoided negative equity because quite simply, there's only one new town and that will always be in demand. So in 82, the government thought they should kickstart the construction in um, um, industry by getting people back into employment, and they offered 90% inner city repair grants across the whole of the UK. Edinburgh became a sea of scaffolding, and here's a painting I had done of one of my buildings in Elm Row with my name at the bottom. <laughs> um, so at 26, I thought I should set up Lauren McNeil Architects. My boss at the time had just graduated, wasn't very keen on social architecture, so I printed off 500 flyers at a local Simon Mallow shop and I pushed them through lots and lots of doors in the new town and elsewhere in Edinburgh. And one th month later, I had five stairs who entrusted totally to my enthusiasm, but certainly not my experience. Um, I had none. Um, but during that time, the 10 years the common repairs worked, I became hugely enthusiastic. I learned all about stonework repairs, lead work, um, all facets of these buildings. And uh, I think I, to some extent, became an expert. But above all, in that 10 years, I learned about three things that were so important throughout my professional life, and that was communication, communication, and communication. Because in every stair, there's one awkward, difficult, <laughs> cantankerous man who made my life hell. Um, ironically, they generally seem to come from the legal profession, but that's by and by. Um, so I worked with Michael as up and down scaffoldings 10 times a day. Um, I really immersed myself in it. I got to know the Newtown Conservation Committee very well, and they started to give enhancement grants to supplement the repair grants where we got involved in window repairs, lead, additional lead work, railings and basements, flagstones back into basement areas, and, re and repairing shop fronts. Here in Elm Row, we put back all these arcade shop fronts, and it was a wonderful scheme that I was very, very proud of. Once we finished it, we did a lovely drawing showing the buildings in its historic form with what we'd achieved 
and we gave these to the various owners and I think the Newtown Conservation Committee got a copy of it as well. Um, so during that time I got to know Desmond Hodges in the Newtown and as I said he mentored me through a lot of things and we, we worked hugely well together. Um, at the same time <laughs> um, I was described as Scotland's leading conservation architect and I was very flattered by that and I think an awful lot of conservation architects would probably beg to differ. But <laughs> there's where I might beg to differ because really um, I can strike a very sensitive chord here that I did consider myself a conservation architect because I did conserve the buildings. I worked awfully hard with my clients. We looked to save the buildings, we looked to restore the roofs, the fabric, and generally give these buildings a longevity. But that by definition, to my mind, is conservation. But what I did want to do was to ensure inside we could push, push out the boat and try and do as much as we could to make that house fit for the purpose of modern living, to adapt to lifestyle of today and not be what, what I call the preservationists would call um, merely the transient occupiers of that building that should be protected as it was in its past. And if you didn't like it, why did you buy it? The Coburn Association, um, it was very much what I call the och no syndrome. No, you can't do that. And no, no, no. So I joined the Coburn Cases Panel for 12 years. I sat at every meeting. I was a bit like in 12 Angry Men. I, I was like um, Henry Fonda, just questioning why, why, why? Why are you doing this? Can't you listen to that? Can't you talk about reason rather than just start condemning everything? Um, Architectural Heritage Society is a wonderful group that was set up really to, to preserve historic architecture. A lot of people have given a lot of their time to it. But interestingly, every time I made an application, and indeed any architect made an application for anything in the new town that invo involved change, resulted in a letter being fired off the planning department objecting. It was just terribly, terribly negative. Historic Scotland, they are the people who prepared all the, the policies, the documentation, and they gave the form from which the planning officers would write the reports. So the planning officers wanted to help, but they couldn't because they were tied up with policy and the fear of precedent being set by allowing one architect something through others didn't allow to happen. So moving forward, architectural, sorry, the HCS, Historic Scotland, <coughs> eventually in 2018 published documents called Managing Change, and that for the very first time was a recognition by Historic Scotland that the houses should be allowed to adapt to the future and we should be able to do things in them that we hadn't been able to do in the past. Um, I, as a conservation architect, I am a, preser a preservationist too, and I certainly think there's a great case for prestige when it's due. At the top of Glenfinlas Street, we have the wonderful infield building at the edge of the Murray Few that was constructed about 1990, and it was an empty few that lay there for many years, and I think what's been done there is absolutely correct. The same in the infill in Clarence Street, which was never built upon because of the stream, but if we didn't have pastiche, we had what we had in, Saint, in uh, Jamaica Street and down at Saunders Street where buildings were ravished the ground in 1970 by at India Place and Saunders Street to create this modern housing block. Um, but certainly there's good modern architecture now. But um, In 1980, I set up my property company, Playfair Properties Limited. It was in reverence to the great man, William Henry Playfair, and also the pun in trying to play fair. It was a great time for me because really as an architect, I bought a flat in Scotland Street and after that two flats in Queen Street and then houses in Harriet Row. But what was readily available were lots of hotels. The Drummond Hotel, which again Kirsty um, was my first um, client there and she bought that from me. And the Linden Hotel we made into flats in Nelson Street, the Newtown Hotel, the Gloucester Hotel. Just lots of hotels that we were, became available where the owners can no longer afford to maintain the hotels because of higher standards being applied by the council. Um, interesting, most of these properties were made into separate flats because that is what the market wanted at that time. People could only afford to live in flats. They couldn't afford to indulge in much bigger townhouse properties. But that slowly changed. And one of the properties I did was 6 to 8 Glenfinnan Street. And that was interesting. That was the former offices of Bailey Gifford. Moving on, one of the properties I bought was 17 Great Stewart Street, and that was very interesting. It was a three stories of the five story townhouse, and I had a wonderful chap, Mr. Packer, who bought the drawing room flat, where we had a wonderful time knotting and graining the woodwork and 
um, seamed carpets and uh, just a wonderful example in his traditional conservation, which again, um, I'm not an architect to be the tail wagging the dog. If that's what a client would like, that is what I would deliver. And I was very, very proud to be involved in that project. Um, but interesting, the very first owner of that house is William Henry Playfair. And there's a signature. He bought the house in 1825 as the first owner for £1,700. And it was his home and office until 1856. I was astonished and delighted that that was the case. And indeed, Alistair Shepherd, who's here tonight, my lawyer, gave me all the old parchment titles, will and testimonies from these properties because um, Cezine's house no longer kept them. They were all being replaced with photocopies. But then I discovered the same property was the office of Sir Robert Lorimer from 1912 to 1929, and he paid £2,200 for it. I won't say what I paid for it, but not even my ego. <laughs> but what I would say, not even my ego or arrogance, who let me occupy that as a third architect, because um, I certainly was never, ever in the league of these two wonderful men. Um, in 1990, I started, at the end of the common repairs, I thought, what will I do? Then I thought, gosh, for five years at university, I'd been trained to think, um, trying, thought, trained to create, and I thought maybe I should get away a bit from conservation and extend the office. And we expanded to about... First of all, five, six, got up to 10, 12 people. And that's what we kept that constant number ever since then. I don't want to be too big or too small, and it's a good number. So here we are at the beach um, in St. Andrews last year, where we had a wonderful day. And uh, that's Michael and I flanking each end. Um, <laughs> um, so when I got involved in architecture and trying to expand a bit, I just diversify slightly and say what we were did during the last 30 years from that time. We got involved in the townhouse refurbishments and I'm terribly proud of the fact that we renovated 21 of the 46 townhouses in Harriet Row. Um, during that time I met Andy Waters, our co-sponsor here at Redbuild, and Andy um, became involved in many of these properties for us, re renovating and restoring them for our clients, also a very discerning standard. Um, but what I would say is through having had the involvement with the properties, uh, played for properties. I, I was very much first on, I was hands on in these buildings. I learned a lot of ways of really saving clients money. Um, with these properties, you learn an awful lot and you can value engineer. I always take a student to look at a townhouse property and when they show a dotted line saying remove a wall, when you look at this two foot thick stone wall, you see the amount of work, effort, time and cost involved in doing that opening it makes us think very carefully of how to effectively design a flat conversion without, with a minimum of intervention. Um, so we then got involved in major conservation projects, restoring Falkland Palace, which was fantastic. And then on behalf of the Landmark Trust, the Dunmore Pineapple and other buildings for them, and a wonderful house up at Newington Arthur Lodge was another great exercise in conservation. We did country houses and estate restoration. In Perthshire, we have Cali House with Colin Buck in here tonight. We had a wonderful house up in Skye. Um, a great project in Perthshire, which was a large estate, which we converted, and in East Lothian, Stevenson House. I'm sorry it's slightly out of focus, but they're all just great projects to become involved in for the practice. Villa refurbishments. Um, we're involved in many villas, and we wanted to try and give these villas a, fresh air, a freshness and create garden rooms that they could bring the gardens into the house and the house back into the gardens. And that example of some villas. New build houses we were involved in up in Arden and Merkin at Glen Borrowdale. In Grange, I got the House of the Year Award about five or six years ago, a house in Inverleith we built and one in Murrayfield are examples. Historic properties, I was very happy to be involved in saving some buildings at risk. Buildings actually bought myself through Playfair Properties the one at St Andrews Gordon Gillen with the former Queen's Hotel. We got involved in that and we created a wonderful um, 16 flats, houses at the back. It was a great project and it won the Scottish Homes House of the um, Scottish Homes Development of the Year. In Helensborough, directly opposite Hill House, was Morrow House, a house built at the same time. And that was in a very sad state of disrepair. So that came at, up at auction. I very foolishly, foolishly bought it <laughs> and spent the next five years um, really um, not enjoying the process, but we got there in the end and, <laughs> and created a wonderful restoration 
um, of the property. Um, education projects with the James Clark Maxwell building here, which Sula, who's up there, was an architect in the office involved in that. Her grandfather, father, and now her brother are all teachers at the, at the academy, so she has a great empathy with the school. At Loretto, we built boarding houses, and for Columba 1400, uh, the leadership centres in Skye and Loch Lomond were other works we did. We got current projects in the go as um, you build houses and houses in the drawing board through various stages of planning, as an example of what we do. But anyway, that's not the focus why I'm here. It's about Georgian townhouses, so, <laughs> so, so sorry. Um, Georgian houses are like cars. Um, when you bought them, like today, it was bespoke as you wanted them. Externally, you'd have to make sure that you had the frontage, the stone frontage right, the windows, the railings, even the lanterns had to be right. But inside, you could do what you wanted to do. And if you were an affluent proprietor, you'd have lovely white Carrera marble fireplace. If you could afford a little less, then you would have a gesso and pine timber one. Um, if you were hugely indulgent, you'd have a wonderful elliptical staircase. Otherwise, you might have a more simple square staircase. Um, and so, really, houses... Sorry, I should go back a bit there. Come on to that. Sorry. Where am I going? Um, and there's lots of other things. Panelling and doors, shutters, um, enrichment of plaster double door sets linking back and front rooms on ground and first floors. Not every house had these, some did, some didn't. It was totally, wholly and totally a personal choice at the time. But when listings were introduced in 1977, houses that didn't have these things weren't allowed to be adapted, which I thought was a real shame. We fought awfully hard. Um, so really throughout my time in working with the Georgian houses, I was out to try and create the dream. Um, here's a property we did at the Royal Circus for the cool tarts, and uh, this was featured in the Scotsman, sorry, Sunday Times. Um, we'd have in these days, in the Georgian house, a back kitchen on the ground floor. We wanted to put it into the front room. We wanted to put double doors through. They said, no, no, you can't have a double door unless it exists, but we'll let you a little side door to pass through between the rooms. It wasn't very good at all. So things changed a bit, and suddenly we started to get kitchens in principal rooms upstairs, the double door sets linking the back through, back through to the front and creating a wonderful suite of rooms that people could really enjoy. The planning of becoming under management, managing change, becoming much more receptive to allowing these things to happen, where really the most important room in the house, where everything happens, the kitchen, living, dining hub, you hardly use the drawing room, so shouldn't that room that's the main hub be the room that is most used in the house and enjoyed in the house? And that is why we want to create these spaces in these rooms. Um, here's a video of a house we recently did with a jib door, and this jib door links through up in... Carlton Terrace to the kitchen and links back into the garden. But again, there we were stymied. We wanted to put double door sets in, but all we could get was a jib door, which is a great pity. Bathrooms, uh, you get a situation where you have a wonderful drawing room house that has a big room that you can't put a bathroom in because the room's to the Georgian proportion, it can't be changed. But you know, why can't you put in a piece of furniture? So what you can do is you can make a bathroom into a pod, and that pod can be a piece of furniture, and it can slot into the room, and you're then complying with the, the regulations. It might be thinking out of the box, but it certainly works, and means that a lot of people who before couldn't use their principal bedroom as a non-suite now can. Um, we have a house in Murray Place where Anne... Sorry, um, for the Moyers, uh, Anne and Mike Moyer, they had a wonderful big drawing room at the front, but they're short of a bedroom. So we created a piece of furniture, uh, a partition wall to freeze height. And one side was the bed and the other side was the drawing room. It works absolutely wonderfully. And I think we're all delighted with it, the way it turned out. Lifts, townhouses, a great issue with the verticality. Townhouses can be four, five, even six stories high. Putting a lift in had in the past been resisted, but now by putting a modest lift in at the back of the house, right up through the building works well. The space behind it can be used for a utility room or each floor above for an ensuite bathroom and gives people the right to get from the top to the bottom of the house. We've done them in Harriet Row, Abercrombie Place in Glenfinlay Street and um, it just certainly opens the whole house up because we're all getting older now, living longer, and our friends are getting older and living longer. So why should we move house and we can make our house adaptable and suit everyone's needs? Um, as you talk about Murray Place now, 
And there's been lots and lots of garden room extensions, and they all happened generally in the Victorian times. There were build rooms and other outbuildings created then. Um, but it's unique, really, to the north side of Murray Place. We become involved in uh, garden room extensions a lot in the office, and where we want to create the garden living hub space, we create the room outside, the, sorry, the extension outside that brings the garden into the house. We have an example up there of a garden room with the views out, and it's just fantastic what can all be achieved. Um, Comedy Bank, we have a situation recently where we wanted to alter a grade A listed house for our clients. And there, we lots of stick about wanting to create, to create an extension. There we were the victims of, of social media. Social media can be very poisoning when a few people can rally together and create a lot of uh, distress for clients through just, um, I don't know, nimby jealousy. I don't know what it is, but certainly it's, um, it's not nice. But interesting, once we started that job, our clients met many of the local neighbours who thought it was fantastic and well done you. So really, um, it's a small minority who can create an awful lot of stink. Um, so, um, talking of muse houses now, we've done lots of muse houses across Edinburgh. And uh, I've been in the paper once or twice. I think I looked a bit younger then, but that was... Uh, <laughs> fortunately, I've still managed to keep my film star looks a bit. Um, <laughs> So the news houses we've done, have, the first one was the one in the bottom left, where it's very much in a traditional style. They wanted the policies then with stone astrical windows and not an awful lot. But with time, they've become a lot less um, severe in what they allow to happen. And the news houses we've created since then have created a lot more atmosphere and character in the back lanes of the new town. Um, I want to talk now about renewable energy and what's been happening is a lot of talk about properties having to achieve an energy rating C by 2025. I don't think it can ever really happen. I say that because in Newtown properties, I was involved in the change works about 10 years ago in a property in Lorison Place. We looked to see how we can best achieve enhanced energy standards throughout that property. Um, it was a listed building and we had to be very careful in what we could do and what would or would not be allowed. Um, the energy rating is C, uh, or is it D? It's one of them we have to achieve, but it's certainly a very high standard to get when most Newtown properties are probably about F or G. Um, the first thing is if you shut a shutter, it's quite extraordinary how much heat you can retain. And if people get the shutters to work, then that is a long way in terms of, heat, of keeping the heat in. The biggest loss of heat has always been through the windows, and by putting in slimline double glazing when you can, it is a very good way of doing that, or indeed introducing secondary uh, magnetic slimline glazing can also improve that. Double glazing cupolas has a huge effect in stopping heat coming out the top of buildings, and lath and plaster walls, people think lath and plaster walls, you heat will come out of that, but actually, these were actually a very good form of retaining heat. It's just left as they are. You can insulate floors when it's in a basement and you don't have nice hardwood floors or flagstones by putting down a urethane back plasterboard. Or you can put solar panels in the roof. Well, no, actually you can't. It'd be nice if you could, but part of the world heritage is that they see the aerial view of Edinburgh as quite important. And the planners are still resisting solar panels in the internal slopes of roof out of the public gaze. Hopefully that will change soon as the whole need for conserving energy will become more important than the need to protect the internal roof pitches of Georgian houses. Um, during all my time, we've been a great pragmatist um, in trying to look to ensure that best value is achieved for all our clients. Um, when I started off, the architects, conservation architects, were trying to suggest that should, where plaster and lath comes down, it should be replaced in plaster and lath, which is utter nonsense. It's usually expensive, using hot hair, cutting laths, had the Georgians had plasterboard 200 years ago, they'd have used it, and they'd used it to very good effect. So um, I'm not into lath and plaster restoration because really my clients aren't funded by the government to restore buildings that are monuments to the nation. Um, you can put sheep's wool in, or you can put rock wool insulation. Um, the cost of the first is so much more than the second, unless you're a complete... Um, environmentalist, uh, it makes no sense at all, but people can have that choice. Um, 
Woods are very important. Original pitch pine that came from ancient woodlands. They were very slow growing. It was a very dense wood, almost like a hardwood. It's a very stable wood and fantastic to work. Modern woods, commercially forested, it's got great uh, sap wood between the growth rings and it's very unstable. It twists, it bends, and if it's not painted regularly or very quickly, basically disintegrate. Um, so when I'm using new facings and skirtings and internal join, joinery, I would always use MDF. It's a very inexpensive, very stable and very effective material. Um, to try and use a pine there would just be complete nonsense. Roofs. Traditionally, we always used leaden roofs. Lead is, was a fantastic material in terms of its appearance, but drawing back, it's usually expensive. It's very heavy to manipulate onto the roof. It needs special short lengths and all sorts of expense in forming the substrates. Um, health and safety wise, it's not very good to use. And finally, in terms of theft, it is very attractive to thieves to sell to the scrapyards. So we can now get zinc roofs or single ply membranes. Single ply membranes is a roofing felt that lasts maybe 30 or 40 years. It's inexpensive and it's away from this legacy of the post-war roofing felts that failed so miserably and our parents said never have a flat roof in a house. Flat roofs with single ply membrane, membranes are fantastic and they should always be used. Um, I'll talk a bit about glazing now. The glass was historically crown glass and that was blown in circles and then cut into small panels. These panels were maximum about two feet by one feet. And these were cut up and put into window frames by using glazing bars. The bubble of glass at the bottom was thrown out, it was dross. It went to the pauper's houses that became ale houses that then eventually became pubs. And if you look at any pubs, you'll see these crowns of glass everywhere. Um, when the Georges designed the houses, they didn't really care about the glazing patterns of windows. Um, they were more interested in the form of the building and when you look at Old Edinburgh, the windows weren't painted white. They were all painted, they were using wood stains in brown, in green and blue, but white paint was rarely used originally. It came in about 1850 when they mixed lead, um, lead carbonate and linseed oil, and it became quite prevalent then. But then in the Newtown Conservation Committee, they came along and they said all the windows should be white. And all the reading should be black. So that created a unity throughout the town, which I think is fantastic. But in these days, you didn't see it. Um, and now, if you look at crown glass, it's wonderful. It creates that wonderful glistening effect as the light shimmers across it. And that's why I think whenever you can keep crown glass, it must be kept. Um, so as a conservationist, I don't think you should be replaced by slim line glazing when people try and do that. Plate glass was introduced first in 1850 towards the end of the Murray Few, and it was really mainly used across in Lermont and Belgrave and Melville Street. You see all the plate glass there. But here it became of huge snob value. People would put plate glass in because it was expensive and uh, they were indulgent, that's what they wanted. And that happened throughout the new town, first, second and third new town, with these windows being altered and changed. And interestingly, when the new town conservation committee were set up, you had grants to take that out and put the astricals back into the windows. Um, I'll talk about stonework and stonework settlement. When these houses were first built, nobody knew about the ground conditions. They didn't know if it was going to be a soft ground or hard ground or a rock or in sand. It wasn't until they started constructing that bits of buildings would settle and they'd have to level the stone through and then they'd build up again. And all that settlement that happened really was very historic. It hasn't been recent and nothing's moved in many, many years but it's frightening to some people to look at it. Um, there's a movement detector that was put in and nothing's moved in that building in 30 years. Um, it's interesting when they repaired the stone, they stepped up and down and I think it just all looked very silly. What you could do instead was just keep the old stone and put in epoxy fillers and repair the stone in that manner, which I think was much, much better. Um, there's lots of internal cracking that happened in buildings and that generally happened through thermal movements. When you get lots of fires burning and the buildings would move around a bit. And when I go around and look at buildings with clients at the very start, they're terribly concerned about these cracks, but really they're nothing to worry about at all. And they're just part of the movement of the house. The house isn't made of lime, it moves around with the weather and temperature extremes. And sometimes you feel a crack in, it just reoccur on the next point of weakness. Um, here we have cracks in the building working on, in 
Murray Place at the moment, we exposed it. And then the builder decided he should point them all up. So they've been pointed up by the engineer and hopefully that should do the trick. But on the outside walls, beside the windows, you get the thermal movement. That's where the inside wall stays of a constant temperature, but outside it goes from minus 10 to probably 30 degrees. And sorry, not 30, 70 degrees. So you get a huge range of temperatures outside and that creates stresses and these cracks to occur. But again, they've been happening for 200 years. The buildings haven't fallen down, they won't fall down, but it's just something that people have to accept and it's not a problem and nothing to worry about whatsoever. Um, Edinburgh had many, many stone quarries. There are 29 quarries, and interesting, if you look at Melville Drive, there are two gate pillars to, at each end, and these were all made from different stones from different quarries from Edinburgh. When a stone was quarried, it was very hard to tell if it was from a good seam or a bad seam, and the masons didn't know. So when they came to build buildings, there's one building that was put up in probably 1810, the next one about 1850 in Fetty's Row using different stones from different quarries. One is absolutely perfect, the other one is completely shot. The stonework is soft, it's spalling, and it needs to be repaired. Um, the portico is just a mess, but it, it, it doesn't look very good, but it won't fall down, for sure. Um, here in Murray Place, I have a client, and there's been past repairs in their building, where the cement's been put in in the past. That needs to be repaired, and that's what we look to do next year and to make it look like it's neighbouring property where all the stones that have been damaged have been indented. So that's really where stones have come from the same quarry, but from good seams and bad seams. So you can't really, no, nobody could tell them these days. It's just um, bad fortune. Here's buildings in St Vincent Street. A whole building frontage was replaced with new stone 30 years ago with the benefit of grants, whereas the one next door has a, an ad hoc repair and patching of all the stones to try and make it um, fit for purpose, but it doesn't look very pretty. Um, stone cleaning has been a big issue. This is in Dune Terrace. Um, stone cleaning is very bad. When you have stone, it has a natural patina, patina from years and years of uh, soot and grime, and it protects the stone surface. And if you try and clean that off with an acid, you end, uh, end up exposing, exposing the stone and make it more susceptible to drawing moisture than in winter time with frost and thaw they can expand and contract and basically throw the surface off the stone. So this is one in Dune Terrace where the architect knew he shouldn't be stone cleaning. At his client's assistant, they went ahead and started doing the work. The council served enforcement. They stopped it in 1990-ish and the architect was taken to the Proctorator Fiscal um, for having tried to attempt to stone clean a building which we just shouldn't be doing in the new town. But interestingly, the stones are getting cleaner and cleaner because with the acid rain, the buildings are getting lighter with time and from the soot and grime of the um, before they had gas central heating everyone had their coal fires or old ricky as we would call it um, there's wonderful artists and craftsmen which we can work with uh, we have charles Fing, ling foundry um, have all the castings for all the railings in edinburgh all the balusters it's a wonderful place and they can cast anything for you who longsdale and dutch who are up in house street who will make all sorts of wonderful old lanterns and Grandison and son are plasterers in the borders, the father and son who can do anything in terms of moulding and <laughs> enriching plaster work to its traditional detail. So these are artisans who are hugely important and fortunately some are keeping going and that's so important to the maintenance of the new town. People have issues with dampness and really if you look at tenements historically, they had chimneys burning 24-7 and these chimneys would draw air through the building, through the rattly windows, up the chimneys, and have a whole wall that was hot. And that warmed the building, and it kept the dampness away. It was drawn out of the floors and walls. In modern times now, we have a totally different uh, situation where we have the floors are damp-proof, the windows are hermetically sealed, the fireplaces are either blocked up or not used, and people cook with lots of water from showers, from hair washing and all sorts of things, creating lots of um, humidity. And therefore, it's a whole different system. So when you damp proof a house, it's all very well, but you've really got to keep the windows open and make sure it's still vented or you have problems in your property. Um, I'll talk rough, briefly on roof terraces. Uh, there's roof terraces been historically in Edinburgh and one's been formed between the valleys of roofs and they're also very good effect. 
they can be very discreet, like the bottom one circled there that's in Abercrombie Place. Um, I think the Bark and Vivian's house um, many years ago. And then there's, more recently, there's been interventions. The one in Murray Place, I think, is really quite discreet in the way it's um, behind the chimneys. And people say, well, can I not do a roof terrace with a glass box now? I'd love to do that. But they were there with a the reason. That house previously had had a lift shaft head at the top of the building or a large water tank. And that gave them the reason, the justification to let that happen. There's also one in Abercrombie Place, which um, has happened quite recently, and there's been lots of fuss about that. Um, people have mixed views as to whether that is appropriate to the new town or not. I will say no more. Um, I'll come on to statutory repairs in the future. Um, I got involved about 10 years ago with a statutory repair, or just a repair to building. It had been repaired before with a common repair. It needed some work to the roof, maybe 30,000 pounds. The owners were in dispute about the titles and who should pay what. And I gave up, so I said, let's just get it off to the council. So we sent it to the council and asked them to enforce a statutory notice. But a month later, I speak, speak to a contractor who said, uh, we're pricing that job for you in Nelson Street. You're one of the owners. I said, yes, that's right. I said, yeah, it's going well. So I said, what sort of price is it going to be? He said, well, probably about 300,000. So I was shocked. So I met the council people there and went up there and Really what they were doing was carry on the legacy of common repairs, but without the benefit of 90% grant, with each householder being expected to pay about 50,000. That was happening all over Edinburgh. So I demanded that I got the common repair back and we repaired the roof and we spent about 30,000 pounds, it was fine. So I told a journalist friend that about a month later and he said, gosh, that's interesting. And next day it went viral in every um, paper across Great Britain it resulted in an investigation, and uh, there was, I think, two or three people actually went to prison for fraud in terms of the system. But the sad thing is that since then, the council have drawn back. Once bitten, twice shy. They don't want to do common repairs any longer. They don't want to do statutory repairs. They're putting more and more of the emphasis on the owners. And when you have houses in Murray Place, it's absolutely fine if there are sole owners or maybe two or three people involved. But in multiple occupancy ten uh, tenements, it's much harder to get agreements. And... What I saw 30 years ago in common repairs and the state condition of many of these houses, it re really was an eye-opener in terms of uh, where, um, where things are going to go. And I do hope the council will become involved again and these buildings can be maintained as they have to be with an affordable cost. Because really, um, if we don't, we're going to see one of these dreadful, dreadful disasters like we saw at Rankin's Fruit Corner. 20 years ago when a poor girl was killed by falling masonry who worked in a restaurant. It was shocking, but um, something like that will sadly have to happen before people's eyes are opened again into the problems we have. Um, I've talked a great deal, and I should probably take some questions now. Um, I would like to just, again, thank everyone who has been involved. Um, I'm delighted I've got here today two of my great legend friends in PC Brown who leapt for Scotland in the line out. He captained Scotland three times against England. Then we've got Jonathan Edwards, who leapt for Great Britain with his world records that 20 years on are still standing. So it's 25 years, Jonathan, uh, 18 metres, 27, which is a f fantastic achievement. And I'd like to talk about leaping as well, because to my mind, that's very important to me, for every client who I have who takes a leap in faith in appointing my firm, my staff, to work with them in their buildings because it's a, an emotional journey, one we enjoy thoroughly and how wonderful it is when we finish a building for our clients and the pride we take in delivering that product to them and the pleasure we hope they elicit from it. Um, that, to my mind, has been all that my life has been about and indeed everyone in the office who is here tonight, they'll be circulating around with drinks, hopefully you can have a chat with them all. Um, I'm taking a less active role in the practice now and gradually giving ownership over to them. So thank you very much for the chance to talk to you all. And I will certainly take questions now, as long as they're nice ones. <laughs> Fairly amazing. If, if anybody had uh, been to our first lecture by Simon Laird and had the story of the new town and added this to it, um, 
I think you could get an architecture degree <laughs> after you've been to a set of the Mori talks. Um, so we're, we'll, we've got time, I think, for a few, quite a few questions. So, gentlemen on the second row. Yeah, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Um, would you say a little more about the issue of internal walls and removing them from both a conservation philosophical point of view and also a practical point of view and where, where you stand on that in relation to what the policies are? I don't believe in this theory about the transient occupiers, and if you don't like it, bugger off and uh, buy somewhere else. I think with houses you can take down walls, you can open up spaces, you can create modern um, houses that are fit for the purpose of people with, with lifestyle. Um, opening up double doors between front and back rooms um, is something that if they are allowed it to do when they built the houses, and some houses I don't see why it can't be in every house. I know that the planning department in certain cases do resist it, more especially when you have a lovely Bowendi room and the rooms aren't symmetrically placed with the room behind, where you can't put a double door set in. But when you can, I think they're becoming more amen amenable towards that. There was a house in uh, Herbert Road where I think the owner a few years ago just went ahead there and made some openings and he could enforce them and serve them before the house could be sold. He had to put them back together again. Um, so, yeah, I, I try and encourage what I can. I like the houses to rock and roll. I like to try and make them fit for a purpose to live in. And I, as I say, sadly, I fight the Okno syndrome every day of my life. And I will continue to do so. Sometimes a silent voice, sometimes it works. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, Lauren, you, you didn't touch on, which I'm, I want to ask you, I'll get yeah. some more questions from the floor in a minute, but... You talked about, uh, to me, about the fact that our, our houses are not fit for purpose for climate change and the roofs. Yeah. You also talked about how possibly this generation wanted bigger kitchens, bigger living spaces, but actually the next generation do Uber Eats. How, how is that going to affect the um, way you work in the future? I think you just got to... It's all an evolutionary process, and I started off in... 1980, um, people wanted flats, they wanted modest spaces, and now people want to indulge in bigger and bigger houses. They get some wonderful whole town houses being done. When Simon, your parents bought into Murray Place in 1966, I think you said they spent £6,000 but lived in the upper part of the house and the rest was given over to offices. Murray Place in these days, it was all about what offices, um, boarding schools, nursing homes, um, health centres. And there were very few people living in houses other than those that rented them. So really you've just got to adapt to what people want at the time. And uh, certainly now I know that in London some houses are being built without any kitchens at all because people just like to eat out. But I still think the important room is the hub space, whether it has a kitchen in it or not. Whatever, wherever people want to live and enjoy their life, that is, must be the principal room in the house. And it shouldn't be closeted into some back room because... Um, the planning system resists it. You got, we've got to try and think laterally. Quite recently with Phil Pritchard, we were doing a planning consultant. I worked a lot with, um, with a situation where they resisted a kitchen being put into the principal room. It turned out that the planning officer there had written a dissertation on this architect and uh, John Ken Ross and tried to res resist it. But we discovered if we just made an application to put in a drain and a, ventila and a ventilator, that was all we needed because you didn't have to define what the room was going to be used for. So the fact that you put a kitchen in there, a kitchen is really in essence pieces of furniture. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, um, there are ways around these things laterally and we just have to...